I'm delighted to participate in this remembrance of and tribute to Rao Wallenberg, Canada's first honorary citizen who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, prevail, and transform history. And to come together on the occasion of Rao Wallenberg Commemorative Day, where the Canadian government in its country pledges at the recent Malmo Conference on Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism undertook to teach so that we can learn the life and legacy of Rao Wallenberg as an inspiration for all Canadians. And I'm delighted also to be able to join my good friends and colleagues, Suzanne Berger and David Matus, both of whom are senior fellows at our Rao Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, with both of whom I've had the pleasure of working together on the case and cause of Rao Wallenberg, that is the looking glass for the struggle for human rights as a whole, and who will be panelists discussing appropriately enough uh, the film respecting the angel of Budapest. From mid-May to early July 1944, some 440,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. The cruelest, most efficient, fastest killing field in all of the Holocaust. Raoul Wallenberg arrived as a Swedish diplomat in the Swedish legation in Budapest in mid-July 1944. And together with his diplomatic colleagues and others, with inspiration and ingenuity, bluff and bravado, saved 100,000 Jews in the next six months. So what the entire international bystander community did not do, one person with integrity showed how one person and each one of us can make a difference. I first learned of Raoul Wallenberg's heroism in the 70s when I acted as counsel for the Association of Survivors of Nazi Oppression and learned from Holocaust survivors amongst them who were saved by Wallenberg of his incredible heroism. I also learned about this from Congressman Tom Lantos, who was himself saved by Wallenberg and who inspired Wallenberg becoming an honorary US citizen in 1981. From my involvement with the Wallenberg family for some 40 years now, Raoul Wallenberg's brother, sister, nieces, where we have been working together with respect to the case and cause of Raoul Wallenberg, and from the Swedish diplomat Per Anger, who worked with Raoul Wallenberg in the rescue of Jews in 1944 and became ambassador to Canada in 1976, and where we worked closely together with respect to learning about and giving expression to Raoul Wallenberg's humanitarian legacy. I also had occasion to address the Swedish parliament in 2012 on the occasion then of the celebration of the centennial of Raoul Wallenberg's life and to witness an exhibit titled in Raoul Wallenberg's own immortal words, for me, there was no other choice which underpinned his embodiment of the Talmudic idiom that if you save a single life, it is as if you have saved an entire universe. And Raoul Wallenberg in his heroism, in transforming history, in saving so many universes, may be said to have presaged what we today would call foundational principles of international human rights, humanitarian and international criminal law. In distributing Schutz passes and providing diplomatic protection for its recipients, or in establishing safe houses and providing diplomatic sanctuary for those housed in them, 
Wallenberg, by this alone, gave expression to what we today would call diplomatic protection and immunity and provided a role model for what human diplomacy should all be about. In setting up hospitals, soup kitchens, orphanages, the staples of humanitarian assistance, providing the elderly, the sick, women, children with a semblance of human dignity, Wallenberg presaged what we today call international humanitarian assistance. In protecting and rescuing civilians from the horrors of the Holocaust, Wallenberg embodied what today we would call the foundational principles of international humanitarian law. And Wallenberg's last rescue was perhaps his most memorable and presaged what today we would call the foundational principles of international criminal law. Nazi generals were marching on Budapest and threatening to blow up the Budapest ghetto and liquidate its 50,000 Jews. Wallenberg warned them that unless they desisted, they would be prosecuted and executed for their war crimes and crimes against humanity. The Nazi generals desisted and some 50,000 Jews were saved by this act of bravado and bluff by Raoul Wallenberg, demonstrating yet again that one person can confront evil, prevail and transform history. And so it was then that to the desk murderer, Adolf Eichmann, Raoul Wallenberg was called the Judenhund Wallenberg, Wallenberg the Jewish dog. But to the Holocaust survivors, to those he saved, Wallenberg was called the guardian angel, and hence the film, The Angel of Budapest. One final word, why Wallenberg saved so many, he was never saved by so many who could. When the Soviets entered Hungary on January 17, 1945 as liberators, rather than treat Wallenberg as a liberator and heroic rescuer that he was, they arrested Wallenberg, imprisoned him, and he disappeared in the gulag. The Soviets gave contradictory stories thereafter that he died of a heart attack in 1947 or he was murdered in 1947, though the evidence was compelling as set forth among other things in a US federal court judgment of 1985 in our uh, commission of inquiry into the fate and whereabouts of Raoul Wallenberg, which we published in 1990, which had the contribution singular one of Guy Van Dardel, Raoul Wallenberg's brother. The evidence disclosed, as in the words of the court itself, that evidence was incontrovertible that Wal Wallenberg did not die in 1947 as the Soviets claimed he did, and was compelling that Wallenberg was alive into the 50s and thereafter. Suzanne Berger, in her incredible research initiative, the Raoul Wallenberg Research Initiative, has been seeking to unearth the truth about the fate and whereabouts of Raoul Wallenberg. What we need now is an international consortium of the countries that have given Wallenberg honorary citizenship to come together to join with Suzanne Berger's initiative and to call upon the Russian leadership to finally open up the archives, to unmask the dark and blank spots of history, and to bring justice and truth and accountability to the fore. That is the least that is owed to Raoul Wallenberg and his legacy, to his family, to the thousands who have been saved by him, to all of humanity. And so may this evening be not only an act of remembrance of the singular heroism 
of Rao Wallenberg, which it is, of the singular understanding of the responsibility to act upon his legacy, may it therefore be a remembrance to act in the pursuit of justice and on behalf of our common humanity. Thank you. Eine Minute. Ich bin Raoul Wallenberg. Within uh, six months, more than 100,000 people were saved. But then within 60 years, uh, millions of people were not able to save this one man. He was a manager. He was a strict manager, an organizer. He was never afraid. He was able to take decision quick. He was a hero. He had never a gun in his pocket. He was forbidding over the whole staff to hold, to hold gun because he told that it's compromising. You should work with word and with paper and without arm. We have a here! As a tribute to its very first honorary citizen, Canada has named January 17th Raoul Wallenberg Day. Every year on this date, three Canadians of Hungarian descent recall how they were saved by the man known as the Angel of Budapest. Oh, I think of him every day. Very, very, I, I can't forget him. He's like a part of my life. It's so important to me because if, if he wouldn't come on, on that time, on that moment, I want to be alive. Wallenberg saved our life some minimum three times, but we cannot even say how many times. Well, we've saved our own life many times as well, but that's another thing. I admire him. He's my hero. I think he, he is a real human being. He is the kind of human being by God created man. It's impossible really to tell exactly how many people he saved, but maybe 100,000. One person can make a tremendous difference, and that is something that we all have to learn. So Andy, we will light a few candles in memory of Van Berg. And I have a few candles here because this is for my parents, your grandparents, who okay. were saved. And this is for all the people who died. We will have a few seconds of silence remembering him and praying for wherever he is for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, dear Mercy. Across Canada on January 17th, 2005, other events were held to ensure that the mystery surrounding Raoul Wallenberg's disappearance would not be forgotten. And to do so on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the disappearance of Raoul Wallenberg, whom the United Nations referred to as the greatest humanitarian of the 20th century. Raoul Wallenberg was our first uh, honorary uh, citizen. We are amongst the few countries that have uh, set aside a day every year to commemorate uh, Raoul Wallenberg's uh, humanitarian legacy and now being the 60th anniversary of his uh, disappearance uh, does give us a certain standing to uh, try to use this as an inspirational legacy uh, for uh, the world throughout. January 17th is not the anniversary of Raoul Wallenberg's birth nor of any of his many achievements. It's the anniversary of his disappearance. January 17th, he is a, a person who was victim of 
the uh, human rights violations. He inspired us to fight for human rights, and we must use that inspiration to fight for his human rights. David Matus is a Winnipeg lawyer who specializes in cases involving human rights. And for the past 30 years, he has dedicated much of his energy to attempting to shed light on the fate of Raoul Wallenberg, last seen in Soviet custody, January 17, 1945. By making Wallenberg an honorary citizen, Canada has claimed the right to demand that any nation be held accountable for the fate of this citizen, just like any other. International law makes it illegal for Wallenberg's fate to remain unknown. Armed with this right, David Matus went to Russia in 1996 to carry on his search. So far, though, he has not succeeded, because Russia has refused him access to its archives. On this 60th anniversary of Wallenberg's disappearance, a Canadian film crew took along two Budapest Holocaust survivors, Maria Gomori and her son Andrew, both now living in Winnipeg. It's the fourth balcony we left. So it was right beside you see that the uh, window. Above yeah. the balcony where the flowers yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was. And that you were was right, by the, right by the edge of the. Yeah. He is interested whether they were <laughs> whether they were shots in the house or not. Yeah. He says it's a nice thing that we come back. Winnipeg, there. Winnipeg. Canada. Canada. Inside, as you look in. But what I do remember that at six o'clock in the morning. I had to come down and there were soldiers here and I could never go back. Yeah, and you had to leave me there. Yeah. yeah. They also brought along David Matus, whose main purpose in Budapest was to revive the investigation. This uh, is the place where Wallenberg worked. It was the embassy of Sweden. Uh, it was the place he left to go to meet the Russians. It's the place where he was last seen in public. It's the place where the mystery of the disappearance of Raoul Wallenberg begins. The honoring of Raoul Wallenberg never ceases, but the fact of helping him is, is almost forgot. The governments that have honored him have put a lot more effort into remembering them than, than to trying to help him. And as a human rights activist, I say to myself, we, we've got to do something, even at this late date, to try to help him and his family, or his family, uh, because his fate to this day remains unknown. In March 1944, Nazi Germany decides to invade Hungary, a former ally of the Reich, which is now ready to defect. Hitler can already feel that he's losing part of the war. Hungary has 750,000 Jews, and Hitler sends in Eichmann, his point man in the final solution. In just a few months, Eichmann will send at least 450,000 Jews to Auschwitz, especially those living in the Hungarian plain. In Budapest, another 300,000 fear the worst the angel of death keeps up a hellish pace. Alors, pour Eichmann, la chose la plus importante de sa vie était de tuer le plus juif possible. Euh, il voulait gagner au moins la guerre contre les juifs. Les ministres du de, de gouvernement de Kratfeshe, ils ont fui déjà Budapest. Alors ici, ils restaient seulement les subordonnés, alors ils n'ont respecté rien. In the last months of 1944, the Germans and the Hungarian militias rounded up hundreds of Jews on a daily basis and took them through the streets to the banks of the Danube. There, they were bundled and tied up together to save bullets. A few shots, and the human bales were tipped into the icy waters. The inhabitants of Budapest were accustomed to calling it the Red Danube. At this point, a spirit of pure humanity appears who will stand up against Eichmann's madness. A diplomat from Sweden will in a few short months manage to save 100,000 Jews from certain death. This is the story of Raoul Wallenberg, the Angel of Budapest. You were uh, 
well hold by one and a half when I was taken away. Okay. In this whole area, everybody who was in a yellow star house had to come down at six o'clock in the morning. It was the Hungarians and the Germans. Yeah. And I came down and I said, yeah, but I have a baby up there. Whatever happens to Jewish babies is going to happen to him. That's what they said. Well, you can imagine how I felt. I was helpless. Yeah, I couldn't go back. And basically, it was really better because those people who, who had their baby with them, they should shot them on the road. Rosa Langer. Eat, eat for you. Danke. Wallenberg est très fameux parce que euh, il était kidnappé après la guerre au, au dernier euh, mois de au dernier mois de au janvier euh, 45 par les Russes. Wallenberg has acquired even greater heroic status by virtue of the fact that he was first taken prisoner by the Soviets despite having saved so many then lost sight of to this very day. David Matus, continuing his battle for human rights around the world, reminds us that the silence surrounding the Wallenberg affair continues to be completely illegal under international law. What we have is a, a new legal framework that was not in place at the time that Wallenberg disappeared. I mean, Wallenberg disappeared in 1945. We didn't have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights till 1948. And since that time, we've seen a, a burgeoning of international human rights standards. What these standards as well do is, is give a, a sensitization, a verbalization of the wrong that was committed. And we can say that this wrong is a continuing wrong, uh, that disappearance is a continuing wrong, as long as the disappearance remains unexplained. Understanding the problem of human rights can only come through education. For this reason, the Asper Foundation of Winnipeg has set up a Holocaust awareness program. The foundation each year finances a trip for young Canadian students to visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington, at least until the opening of the Human Rights Museum in Winnipeg in the near future. This program is to teach students, using the example of the Holocaust, show them how easy it is to lose your freedom if you're not vigilant, and to make them understand how blessed they are to live in Canada, and to make them understand that they have a responsibility to ensure that Canada remains a country of freedom. On their visit to Washington, these young people meet Congressman Tom Lantos, himself a Holocaust survivor, who tells them his own story. There isn't any place to go learn about Rwanda. There isn't any place to learn about the uh, cultural genocide of the Aboriginal people in Canada. So there are horrible atrocities that have happened in the world. It so happens that this place is so graphic and so well done that it serves as a great learning tool, as a stepping board to the, the real issues of what are we doing in the world today. In 1944, Americans, especially those of Jewish descent, were well informed of the horrors being carried out in Europe and they wanted at all costs to try and do something to save as many Jews as possible. The U.S. created the War Refugee Board whose mandate was to provide financial and logistical support to any relief effort that might help Jews in Europe. It really started when uh, Raoul was in Haifa because there he started meeting some refugees who were leaving Germany, who were fleeing away from Germany, who told him about the persecution of Jews. So then he started really to understand something was going on. So they were looking after a man who would agree to go to this hell. And the company where Raoul was working was in the same building as the American embassy. In fact, they met 
and uh, he was uh, employed for that mission. But also he had wanted to make this kind of mission without having the context to, to do so. So the Swedish king gave him a, a diplomatic passport because, of course, he was an architect and a businessman and didn't have any education to be a diplomat. But he negotiated the conditions on which he would like to do this work and got his diplomatic passport for six months. Il était le dernier parmi les diplomates qui arrivait à Budapest, qui était ici. Par exemple, Angelo Rotta, le nom apostolique, était ici déjà depuis des années. Karl Lutz était déjà ici depuis 1942. Mais Wallenberg était le plus jeune et, et il arrivait le, le dernier. Mais Wallenberg était parmi eux l'un des plus braves, vraiment. Wallenberg's nieces, Louise van Dordel and Marie Dupuis, live near Paris. They explain the origins of this exemplary destiny. So he was born into a very powerful uh, banking family called the Wallenberg family. And uh, he was married to my grandmother, whose name was Mai, like the month of May. And uh, it was very unfortunate because just a few months after their marriage, her husband Raoul died. And that was just a few months before the baby's birth. A few months after the death of the father, his grandfather, the father of my grandmother, died. So in fact, his five first years, he, were, he was brought up by two widows in black. At the time, the Wallenberg family was the most powerful in Sweden. In 1944, they already owned at least 50 companies and employed over 200,000 people. Their income was several billion dollars a year. They included bank and factory owners, as well as diplomats and businessmen involved in several European countries. So Gustavo was quite a special person because he was from this powerful family, but he was also a visionary. So he had lots of uh, initiatives in his life, you know, thinking about communication and things like that. And for him, it was very important to create some kind of network in the world. He was kind of leading the education of his grandson, who he loved a lot. Uh, for Gustav, the main thing was to remain a free man. So he told Raoul not to get married early, not to get into a profession or to, into a career. And he told him, try to learn as much as you can from books, from your experiences, learn about harmony and about people. And don't get into any profession before you are 30. When you'll be 30, you'll know what you want to do, what is your mission in life. The main stratagem used by this new diplomat in his campaign to save Jews was the creation of a false Swedish passport called a Schutzpass. The Schutzpass asserted that the bearer was a Swedish citizen being repatriated to his homeland. In only a few months, Wallenberg will issue thousands of Schutzpasses. One of the first people to receive such a passport was Dr. Erwin Koranyi of Ottawa. And then I heard some crazy thing I couldn't believe, that a Swedish diplomat came to Budapest and he's trying to save some Jews. In the first visit he said that, do you have any Swedish connection Anything, anything is good. I couldn't think of it. And then it occurred to me that my father, years before, began to have a business contact with a Swedish company. So I told Wallenberg, yes, we have that. He says, wonderful, that's enough, that's enough. He gave a schutzpass to me, to my parents, to my sister, and to my wife, Alice who didn't know anything but was in this uh, camp waiting to be transported to Auschwitz. Another two days later, policeman comes up to her and says, well, you can go home, you are a Swedish citizen. And she, said, she thought that the policeman is crazy. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But 
she and some, all together, five, five of them were brought to Budapest, to the Swedish embassy, to Raul Wallenberg, and I was waiting for there. And she was allowed to go. There is a very famous moment of the Wallenberg saga. There were prepared about 800 youngsters between 16 and 30 years for deportation. And one of the non-Jewish collaborators, the colonel of Gendarmerie Paradi, gave notice to, to Wallenberg that there is an action going on at Josef Arosh railway station. We arrived there and Wallenberg telling that those people who have lost their shoes pass should come here. And of course, the people who have had some brain, at least 300 from the whole crowd, they were coming in the other corner, and then we were staying there with, with empty papers. And we were reading well-known Jewish names. It always was coming somebody. And there on the place were filled the shoes passes and stamped without photos. But we told them, come next day to the embassy, which put your photos in the... They were just kidding. À Budapest, euh, au moment quand les croix fléchées ont pris le pouvoir, il y avait à peu près euh, 200-250 juifs. Saloshi a fait euh, organiser deux ghettos à Budapest, le ghetto international, où il y avait à peu près 35 000 personnes. Dans le grand ghetto, Euh, autour de la synagogue de Dohanyutsa, il y avait euh, 70 000 personnes. C'était ici le ghetto international, ou autrement dit le ghetto protégé. Ghetto protégé, entre guillemets, parce que ici il y avait des bâtiments que les différents diplomates, euh, diplomates euh, par exemple Raoul Wallenberg, fait sous son protection plus que 10 euh, différents bâtiments ici. Et ici, sur les bâtiments, il y avait des plaques que ce bâtiment est sous la protection de, de la Suède, ou de la Suisse ou le Vatican. Et ici, le numéro 6, c'était le centre des policiers qui a fait organiser les distrib la distribution des Juifs de, de Budapest. Ici, vous pouvez imaginer que maintenant quelques milliers de personnes habitent euh, assez aisément dans ces appartements luxueux. Mais à l'époque, c'est plus que 35 000 juifs habitaient ici, dans un état horrible. Mais quand même, c'était un endroit où tout le monde, les juifs non protégés, voulaient vivre. Si vous regardez mon passeport de défense, mais il a reçu le passeport de pass, le nombre sur it is 160, something like that. So I was one of the first one who got it. He himself didn't know. He just arrived to Budapest. He just was trying to find out what's going on. But you see, he learned. He learned very fast. When he got this permission to save 1,000 people, he issued 5,000. When he reached the 5,000, he printed another 25,000, and so on and so forth. A man so full of energy and so deter full of determination that it was simply amazing. He was an incredible fighter. The Wallenberg mystery and the violations of international law, which are all part of the file, are carefully explained to visitors at the Jewish Museum in Budapest located in the same building as the Great Synagogue, which still reigns supreme over the heart of the former ghetto. David Matus sees it as a precious resource, giving him the energy he needs to continue his investigations into the truth about what happened to Wallenberg. For him, the wall of silence maintained by the Russians is unacceptable in this day and age.
Susan Vadney of Montreal describes the horror she lived through at 41 Katona Yosef Street, very near the Danube. She tells how one morning Wallenberg showed up and pulled her out of a death march that would have led her to Auschwitz. We were taken downstairs. They said everybody, the whole building has to come out and wait in the line. There was a very, very long line. Thousands of people are waiting there. Suddenly, a black limousine showed up, and that was Wallenberg's car. And he got out of the car, and with an interpreter, he spoke to the Nazis that the people who have uh, the shoots pass with his signature should get out of the line and go home because they are under his protection. So at that time, the Nazi officers accepted it and said, OK, people showed the paper, my father showed the three paper, and we were able to get out of the line and go back home. Here is a man like in the opera, Lohengrin is coming to save Elsa from Wagner's opera, Lohengrin, that she was in trouble and he came in the last moment to save her life. Maria Gomori of Winnipeg, whose parents held Schutz passes, took advantage of the situation, feeling sure they would be able to return and get her son Andrew left alone in the apartment. And I hated everything here. It was, we were allied with the Germans, and there was already a lot of trouble. You see, I remember it was much better shape. <laughs> it, it was didn't... better shape then, yeah. 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 Our was... connection to Wannberg is that my parents wouldn't have survived. So my father had Andy. So it was about a week, a five-day period that I wasn't here. During that time, my, my father picked up Andy and moved to a Swedish house. All the babies who were left around, they were taken to the synagogue and killed there. And the graves are around, I don't know whether you saw it, the graves of these children are outside the synagogue in the garden. So he would have ended up there. My, my throat is almost stopping to talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of memories. Also, good memory, because my husband, I did not know whether he would be alive. He was in a <coughs> German concentration camp in Buchenwald. And he came home two months after the war ended because he was taken to Czechoslovakia. And so he came back here. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. top balcony. Top balcony. Yeah. We have a picture of me hanging on the rail because yeah. I was not tall enough to yeah. stand, so I had to pull myself up on the rail to. That was already when your father yeah. was home. Yeah. Yeah. You had to survive from night to night. Meanwhile, they set up the ghetto. Meanwhile, they took all the Jews to the ghetto in groups. And during these marches from the different part of the city, many times they, they, each time they shot, I don't know how many, on the street as they were marching. So the city was by that time full of corpses. In January 7, 1945, I was in this Swedish building, still under the Nazis, and a group of Nazis entered. Most people were in the basement because of the bombardment. So they went down and everybody, they couldn't escape. They were locked in. We stayed upstairs to hide. Because then the Nazis went up to the top floor and then down floor by floor, room by room, and it was the third floor and we were hanging out on the window and 
holding ourselves up. Uh, was, and that's the way we were hiding. The Nazis were taking people to the Danube, shooting them, and throw the bodies in the Danube. They did thousands and thousands of them, I don't know how many, who were killed in that fashion. Then we were escaping to another building, which we knew also as a Swedish uh, extension building. And the first night, we were where Nazis came in and took us as a group. And then they took, group by group, they took them out without any clothes to the Danube, this was January, and shot them. And all of a nowhere, Wallenberg appeared with a high-ranking Hungarian uh, police officers and took us back to the Swedish building and it was all resolved. And we survived. This way. And even then when they took us, I did not know that we never come back. We did not know where they take us. It was like they take cattle, you know, not people. So they decided to take the rest of the Jewish people from Budapest uh, to Germany, walking. There was no way to escape back because they told us every morning whoever escapes is going to be shot. And they were sh shooting people like right and left who couldn't walk. But I decided I try to escape because I'd rather die than go because I didn't know what's happening to him. So actually he saved my life. Because if I don't have a baby here, I don't dare to, uh, to do that. It was totally crazy. There was this one moment, everybody was already uh, pushed into the barn. I was the last row, it was pitch dark, and I just crawled down and went opposite, like the whole group went this way, and I went back into a horse, horse barn. And I was hiding in that barn, and then everything became calm, and, and it was pitch dark, and then I didn't know where to go, but what's next? It was really a miracle that I got back because I heard steps going by and, uh, and I crawled to this person who was, uh, who, who was walking by. I didn't know whether he is a German soldier, Hungarian soldier, who he is. And I said, can you help us? As, as it turned out, these were two Jewish young men who were nearby in a labor camp. And they knew that their wives are in this march. And because it was dark, for the same reason that I could escape, they couldn't, they couldn't see them. I couldn't believe it when I got back. I found out the night I got back, I, got, I went to my godparents and found out that Andy is with my parents. Well, my parents and Andy survived because of Oliver. Somebody phoned my father that in the area where I lived, uh, they, what they did, they were gathering people together, and so he he ran over. He did not know whether they took me or not, but he ran over right away. Because he had Andy, he decided the moment he had this baby, he decided he, they are going to go to a Swedish uh, house because he wanted to make sure that Andy is in a good place, and he knew that if he goes to the ghetto, his life is in danger again. And 
after that, next time they again they collected us from the building. We had to go downstairs again, and uh, uh, they said uh, they don't care for the suits pass or not. One uh, man came there and he tear up all the suits pass. He said, "You go to the ghetto and you will die like the rest of the bloody Jews." And then they started to turn us around, and instead of going to the west, we started to go back to Budapest, uh, uh, you know, the other district, because the ghetto was in the seventh district, that's about the center of Budapest. So we were all marching uh, there uh, to the ghetto. American came bombing, the Russians were uh, bombing, and uh, many people just died on the street. And the houses were falling down and it was fire and it was something horrible like uh, when you see in the movie that uh, there is a siege in the city that was and they didn't let us uh, go inside. I, I, I didn't know what to do, we didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were just afraid and we were not allowed to go inside anywhere. And uh, we survived, we were standing there until the alarm and when the, uh, the bombing was over, then we got out and the next street was already in the ghetto, the entrance. It was terrible. There was nothing to eat and people were dying by the hundreds every day. The, the carriage came with the horse carriage every time just to take away the dead people. It was terrible. It is December 1944, and the Nazis, along with the Hungarian militias, have decided to blow up the ghetto, instantly killing its 70,000 occupants. Here, Vornberg acts again. I think there were three persons who negotiated with the general who was supposed to blow up the ghetto. And in fact, they were using the authority that Raoul Wallenberg still had uh, to say that if the ghetto was blown up, he was going to the general was personally be considered as responsible and so he would be brought into court. My husband came back two months after the war ended. I remember I was with Andy on the island and somebody came running <laughs> that he's at home. And how was he? How Terrible. Was he? Only, only bones. You see, I wanted to I, I absolutely decided to go to England as, as soon as he comes home or if he doesn't come home, I take Andy because I had relatives there. All my cousins were there. His sister was there. And when my husband came home, he said he's not going anywhere. So we stayed. Maria's return to Budapest gave her the chance to visit her father's grave. And Andrew got the chance to pay tribute to the man who saved him. My father was that kind of a person. He would, he would rather die than not save us. I was very close to him. He, I mean, he was the most important person for me. I don't know whether I come back here, but I'm certainly glad that I'm here right now. I believe that people who die, they know when you visit them. I do believe that. Over 430,000 Hungarian Jews deported to Auschwitz in 1944 would have been deprived of burial in the Jewish cemetery in Budapest. A few days before Budapest was liberated by the Soviets, Wallenberg went to meet the generals and negotiate for the ghetto Jews. It was January 17, 1945. No one ever saw him again. The Soviets took him prisoner and then to Moscow. On arrival in Stockholm of the Swedish legation staff from Budapest, and particularly the absence of attache Raoul Wallenberg. Ever since 1945, they have consistently lied about what happened to him. David Matus recalls a few of the official versions. I mean, it's true there has been a history of lies, and uh, I've had a chance to go through the internal documents uh, that generated those lies, and so it's apparent that they were lies because what they were telling to, to each other 
was very different from what they were telling the world. At the time when they knew they had Raul Wallenberg in their custody, they were telling the world they didn't know what happened to him, uh, that he uh, had been killed uh, uh, by the Nazis and so on. And uh, later on, uh, they changed their lie to the saying that he died of a heart attack in prison. And you could see in the internal memoranda changing the prison uh, and uh, changing uh, the, the uh, circumstances surrounding his death. And, uh, and then they were periodically saying that they searched the records and we know that they didn't search the records. And the reason they shifted their lies over time is that over time more information came out about him and the fact that he was in Soviet hands. So they couldn't maintain the old lies and they had to shift to new lies uh, consistent with those criteria. Je pense que il est mort quelque part, je ne sais pas quand et je ne sais pas où en Union soviétique. Les archives n'ont pas ouvert. Alors c'est toute l'histoire de l'Union soviétique. Il n'y a pas assez de liberté de recherche maintenant en Union soviétique. C'est seulement des fragments qu'on peut avoir sur le passé de l'Union soviétique à partir de 1917 jusqu'au nos jours. Alors, c'est pas seulement l'affaire de Wallenberg qu'il faut clarifier, mais c'est toute l'histoire de l'Union soviétique. Well, in 89, of course, it was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And they re released a number of personal documents, which they said tumbled out of a file, which they found when they were converting their wooden files to metal files. But it was not a very credible lie, even that, because the various documents they found, according to the Soviet filing system, would have been kept in separate files. They wouldn't have all been found in, in, in one file. And, and of course, Wallenberg was the most famous prisoner they'd ever had. So the notion that somehow these documents were somehow misplaced uh, is, is, is simply not credible. While David Matus and some of his colleagues continue to try and clear up the mystery surrounding Wallenberg, the city of Budapest has decided to honor its dead. A monument to those Jews who were shot and thrown into the Danube was unveiled a few years ago. Still, despite the best efforts to gain respect for human rights, the specter of anti-Semitism still hangs over the city. The monument was recently vandalized by pro-Nazi militants. C'était des antisémites qui, il y a quelques semaines, et ils ont pris les deux ou trois souliers et ils ont jeté dans le Danube. C'est à peu près 7 ou 10 cents pour la, de la population de la Hongrie peut considérer comme antisémite. Pas plus qu'en France ou pas plus qu'en qu Allemagne. C'est exactement 10% plus que je peux tolérer, mais je dois vivre avec. Je suis hongrois, mais quand j'encontre avec un antisémite, je me considère et je déclare que je suis juif. In addition to David Matus, certainly one of the most dogged researchers into the Wallenberg file has been the diplomat's half-brother, Guy van Dardo. He has invested years tirelessly seeking to find out what happened. His daughters, Marie and Louise, have now taken up the cause. I think that he, he's, um, he's very disappointed not having su succeeded to bring him home, because that was really uh, what he wanted, to bring him home. And, and he has been very disappointed by, by, the, by the, the Swedish government. Uh, my father um, took contact with the Russians um, at, uh, when um, Gorbachev was in power. And, uh, and in, after one and a half year of negotiations, he succeeded to have the permission to go to um, the Vladimir prison and uh, make researches in the archives. He went to Russia about 30 times because uh, uh, Raoul was a fantastic man. And so we, he's part of our, the family and we are very proud of him, so we can't just uh, sit and doing nothing and and also that uh, it's uh, unclassified uh, to, to get uh, a silence as an answer for questions is not satisfying and uh, we would like to have the truth now the, after 60 years that's uh, not too much asked Alors l'industrie de la Suède, comme l'industrie euh, de Portugal ou de l'Espagne ou des autres pays neutres, ils ont fait le big business avec les Allemands. Les Suédois, ils ont envoyé par des milliers et milliers de tonnes de l'acier et des autres euh, 
euh, marchandises très importantes pour la, la machine de guerre des Allemands. Alors, la, la famille Wallenberg, qui était une des familles les plus riches, et maintenant elle est aussi une des familles les plus riches de, de, de Suède, et ils ont collaboré avec les nazis, quand ils ont collaboré les Suisses, les banques suisses, les fameux affaires des, des ors de Suisse, les Portugais, les Espagnols et les autres pays neutres, tout le monde a collaboré avec les nazis. The investigation into Wallenberg's fate has been derailed many times since World War II by the political interests of neutral countries. Large capital interests are involved, and each actor in the drama has had his own strings to pull, always using Wallenberg to his own ends. The file has dragged on and been subject to so much disinformation in wheeling and dealing that people have begun to weary of the whole business. Loss of interest has pushed the issue into near oblivion. Still, despite all the foot-dragging, David Matus is determined to carry on. He still works on motivating people around the world, gathers them together, and puts forward new plans for action. Tomorrow uh, I'm going to Paris. Uh, I'm going to meet with the nieces of Raoul Wallenberg in the house of uh, Mary Dupuis, who's one of the nieces. We're going to have uh, someone join us from Israel. We're going to have a couple people phone in from uh, the United States and, and Canada, Minister Erwin Cutler, and we're going to talk about the strategy for uh, pursuing this file to see what we can do next. Uh, what we're seeing is, is a changing of the guard because, I mean, historically it was Guy von Dartle who's been following this file, but now it's his daughters that are taking the lead within his family and following the file. And, and, and uh, we are seeing uh, Per Anger used to be, of course, very important in Sweden, and there's a new younger generation of uh, Swedish uh, advocates uh, dealing with this file and, and so on. And what this shows is that the case of Wallenberg is never going to rest until it's solved. That a human rights violation, it concerns all humanity, and humanity is going to remain concerned. It's not going to go away just because the Russians say the case is solved and, and we've dealt with it. It's only going to go away once we get the answers. And the, the changing of the guard doesn't mean a, a, a dissipation of interest. It, it shows that the, the determination to resolve this uh, human rights violation will remain uh, until it's addressed properly. Uh, you see, when, when you come back from that kind of a thing, you don't even know anymore who you are. Uh, but I also want to tell you, it changed me also a lot, because pretty soon I had the feeling that God helped me to, to get out from this horror. And I was ne no longer, never afraid of anything or anybody. What uh, gave me this uh, inside, uh, this will or this, this idea that I will survive that and uh, I will go for a long trip, I will go far away from here. Somehow this uh, kept me going. I was thinking on the high mountains and the ocean and the big ships that I will go on a big <laughs> ship one day. And it really happened. <laughs> Came to Canada on a big ship. <laughs> It made me think, it made me think, and I concluded a few points. And concluded that maybe we all have a murderer within ourselves somewhere. And we have to ourselves control it. I gained an insight about prejudice. I don't think that prejudice is learned. I think that prejudice is born with us. I think we have to work on it, very hard work on it, to overcome it.
The beautiful f the story of Raoul is that he saved many people, but the sad side of the story is that no one succeeded to bring him home, and and uh, it, uh, he Raoul succeeded to make the impossible, and others never succeeded to make the impossible to to bring him home. Le deuil n'est absolument pas fait. Euh, pour pouvoir faire son deuil, il faut savoir pardonner. Et euh, si on ne connaît pas la vérité, on ne peut pas pardonner. Quand j'ai rencontré le jeune homme qui avait un grand-père qui avait été sauvé par Raoul, et cela m'avait énormément touché, je me suis dit que Raoul avait des enfants. Grâce à tous les, enf tous les enfants qu'il a sauvés, c'était ses enfants. Et qu'il il avait une famille et qu'il était grand-père des milliers de fois. Et j'ai trouvé ça merveilleux de savoir qu'il était entouré d'autant de, de monde de, qui pouvait être sa famille. Finalement, ça a été une grande consolation de voir qu'il y a autour de, de nous, dans, la, enfin dans plein de pays différents, des, des, des jeunes, des enfants de Raoul qui, qui vivent heureux et qui, ont, qui ont mènent une vie normale. Et ça, c'est vraiment une grande consolation. Et euh, merci, merci. Good evening. I'm Michael Mostyn, Chief Executive Officer of B'nai B'rith Canada. It is my privilege today to moderate what we believe will be a highly informative and revealing presentation to you. We are here to discuss the legacy of Raoul Wallenberg, whose actions saved up to 100,000 Hungarian Jews during World War II. Wallenberg, a man whose sense of justice was motivated by neither fame nor fortune, is undoubtedly one of the great heroes of the era. Just before we get into it, I, I would like to pay tribute very briefly to Maria Gamore, who passed away on December the 10th. She was uh, a Wallenberg survivor who was interviewed in the film that we just saw. She ended up having a successful and distinguished career as a psychotherapist, having um, survived the Holocaust. She really gave a substantial contribution uh, to her field and may her memory be a blessing. From a position of diplomatic prestige, Wallenberg used tools, including certificates of protection, to safeguard Jewish men, women, and children. Additionally, he helped operate more than 30 safe houses in Budapest that provided refuge to the besieged Jewish community. Here to join us today for a discussion about Raul Wallenberg and specifically about his mysterious disappearance are two experts who have devoted countless hours to studying Wallenberg's life and heroics. Susanna Berger is a historian whose research addresses, among other things, the political and economic aspects of Raoul Wallenberg's mission to Budapest and his disappearance. In 2015, she founded the Raoul Wallenberg Research Initiative. This alliance of more than 80 international historians, families of political prisoners, legal experts, Holocaust survivors, and human rights defenders tries to obtain access to relevant files in Russian archives that will shed light on Wallenberg's fate. Our second guest, David Matus, is a renowned Canadian human rights lawyer and namesake of the Matus Law Society. His outstanding work earned him many awards, including the Order of Canada, and he was nominated for the Nobel Prize for his persistent advocacy on organ harvesting targeting Falun Gong practitioners. He has written extensively on the disappearance of Raoul Wallenberg and has lobbied tirelessly to get access to Russian archives. So just a reminder that uh, you can see in the link below, there is a petition and a call to action. Please go ahead, sign that petition, 
and assist us in the call for justice for Raul Wallenberg. Let's get right into um, the first question. And Susanna, maybe I'll direct this at you and, and we'll go back and forth and David will include you next. But uh, Susanna, what do we not yet know about the fate of Raul Wallenberg? Well, obviously, even after now 77 years after his disappearance in the Soviet Union, we still do not know exactly what happened to Raul Wallenberg once his trail breaks off or broke off in the Lubyanka prison in July 1947. That is, we do not know exactly when he died, how he died, how long he lived exactly. So all of these questions are open even after uh, extensive efforts and investigations conducted by the official Swedish-Russian working group, which investigated uh, his fate in Russia for about a decade in the 1990s, and uh, other inquiries that continued afterwards, in particular, uh, you know, research conducted by myself and other historians, especially my colleague Vadim Bierstein, you know, in exchange, we, we maintained a very close exchange with the FSB archive in order to address still outstanding questions to obtain access to specific records. We can get into that later. But in terms of Wallenberg's fate, uh, there's also questions that remain unanswered really in all phases of the Wallenberg case. Uh, that is, you know, Wallenberg's personal background and um, his professional activities his contacts and activities in Hungary, as well as, you know, his disappearance in the Soviet Union. So we still do not know exactly how he was uh, selected for the mission to Hungary. There is new information that has emerged in recent years about his, um, you know, wide network of contacts and, and what, you know, all the things that he was doing in Hungary. So there's really a myriad of questions that remain and that we still do not know about. Yeah, I, I could add uh, to that a, a, a bit. Uh, the problem we face is, is not just that we don't know things, but also historically uh, with the Soviets, there's been active fabrication. Uh, and uh, that, of course, muddies the waters consistently. And the, the, the fabrications keep on changing. Uh, at one point, they say one thing, another thing, they say another thing. Uh, and uh, it... it it becomes much more difficult to piece out what's true and what's not true, what's known and not known and with this kind of cloud of fabrication surrounding it. Yeah, thanks, David. And that's something that I think uh, many of our listeners here today may not understand. Uh, you're talking about the Soviet fabrication and that the story keeps changing. So uh, I guess my first question to both of you is, um, how, why would we say that? Why would we say that that we know that there's Soviet fabrication? The story keeps changing. How does the story keep changing? And um, uh, and then maybe we'll we'll go from there into into maybe some smaller specific details. Well, I think the most uh, salient example is that for many years after Wallenberg's um, disappearance, the Soviet authorities claimed strenuously that they had no information about Wallenberg's whereabouts, that he was not in the Soviet Union, that they had no information about him at all. They maintained this well into the 1950s. Only in 1957 did they finally issue a statement that, yes, or Ralph Wallenberg had in fact been imprisoned in Moscow, but that he had died supposedly suddenly of a heart attack in prison. So, you know, the, the story kept changing in terms of there was a complete denial, then there was a somewhat uh, acceptance of the facts that he had been in the Soviet Union, but then they made a claim that he had died suddenly, which was an uh, extremely unlikely scenario for a man of, uh, you know, 35 or 34 at the time. So all of these, all of these um, changing storylines have, of course, led to a, you know, a consistent and growing skepticism regarding any kind of official statements that have been made about Wallenberg's uh, fate and, uh, you know, what has possibly happened to him, you know, once his, uh, once his trail breaks off in Lubyanka. That's really the big problem because we, you know, there have been 
uh, witness testimonies, uh, saying, you know, re reports that witnesses have heard about him or met him personally after his official death date, which is July 17, 1947. However, unfortunately, so far, none of these testimonies have been corroborated or could be confirmed. And so the, the Russian, you know, the statements by the Russian officials also continued to be problematic in the 1990s, unfortunately, because they released documentation but then they also withheld very crucial documentation, in particular information about the, the uh, prisoner number seven who was interrogated on July 23rd, 1947, and who apparently is identical with Raoul Wallenberg. This prisoner was interrogated together with Wallenberg's driver, Wilmo Schlangfelder, his, who was his driver and really also his assistant, for more than 16 and a half hours. So unfortunately, this information was not released during the time of the working group during the 1990s. So the question is, why did this, the Russian side withhold this information? The decision appears to be clearly intentional. And one of the possible explanations is that they wish to avoid any kind of controversy or discussion about the fact that Wallenberg possibly was alive after his official death date. So all of this is of, of course, uh, very troubling to not only researchers, but also to follow Beck's family, because this commission was, of course, supposedly uh, created in order to determine exactly what happened. So here again, after, um, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, everybody had great hopes and great faith that information would now slowly emerge that, you know, we could rely on that the family would finally learn the truth. And yet again, information was distorted or withheld. So this is, this is a serious problem. Yes, uh, I could uh, add uh, something to that. Uh, it, it, the original version was that Wallenberg died in 45, and as uh, Susanna said, uh, never uh, died, uh, died in uh, Hungary. Uh, and uh, oh, yes. Is, is he, uh, and uh, then th they were producing this version uh, that he died in 47. Uh, and the Russians and the Soviets, they released some documents. And of course, those documents raised more questions than they answered. And so what we saw uh, with uh, the, the 1947 version of his death is various drafts of the document uh, explaining uh, of how he died and where he died and so on. And, and, the, and the drafts changed the story, like they changed uh, where he was being held, what, what prison he was being held in. Uh, and uh, the, and, and it, it looked like these documents were concocted with the purpose of conforming to what the West knew at the time. Uh, so they couldn't be easily contradicted. Uh, but they said, uh, but otherwise, uh, they seem to be, they seem not to be based on real research. So one of the things the a memorandum said was that they looked at the medical records of a prison where which had no medical records, and or uh, that they went to this prison to look at the records. And you go to the prison, and they say nobody ever came to us. Things like that. Uh, so it, it, there's just this kind of trail of documents that uh, really uh, make us wonder what's going on rather than tell us what's going on. Well, I think I should clarify a little bit. I think the only official document that the Soviet side has, at the time, Soviet side released about Wallenberg's fate is the so-called Smoltsov note, which is the note by the head of the Lubyanka Medical Service in which he stated that Wallenberg had suddenly died during the night in his cell of a heart attack. Uh, the document has been supposedly authenticated, however, um, so, but the content itself is, you know, is questionable because there has been no evidence to suggest or no further evidence provided that Wallenberg indeed died. There is no cremation uh, report, no autopsy report, as was usually uh, accompanying a note, notice like that, a death notice. So there's myriad of questions that remain about this documentation. Also, the Soviet side and the Russian government later on have never clarified where exactly this document was found. 
So nobody knows you know, how it was created. The genesis of this document is completely unclear. So therefore, there is no evidence that would hold up scrutiny that Wallenberg indeed uh, died at that time in the conditions that were supposedly stated. So this, is, uh, this has added to the confusion and to the lingering questions. Well, absolutely, and this, and I think it really adds to the mystery uh, around uh, the, the fate of, of Raoul Wallenberg, because it sounds like there was a lot of research and policy work around this document, which, uh, which you know, you as experts don't um, uh, believe tells the true story of, of what ultimately happened to Raoul Wallenberg. So how do we know that the Russians uh, today, Soviets before, are not disclosing all of the information uh, that they that they have on Wallenberg? Is there more information out there uh, other than what's being put forward? Well, one of the examples I just mentioned is that um, during the time of the working group, the the Russian officials supposedly released all documentation uh, from the so-called prison registers in the prisons in which Wallenberg was supposedly held, uh, or was held, in fact, Lubyanka and Lefortovo prison. However, they did withhold a crucial document which showed that a prisoner number seven was interrogated for 16 and a half hours. So, you know, this in itself already indicates that even at that late stage, um, the, the Russian side engaged in a highly selective release of documentation. We also only received copies of documents and sometimes heavily censored copies. And uh, in some cases, these censored portions have not been cleared. They have not been revealed. So, um, you know, the, the information, it's very clear that the Russian side has additional information that it is not ready and willing to share. We are now at a stage where we have um, received um, notice that they will now provide some records regarding or some entries for prisoner number seven that have not been shared so far. So we, we are hopeful that we will now get to see the originals. But this is one of the biggest problems that we were not allowed to review original uh, documents and in the original content, uh, in the original context. That really has had severely hampered the uh, investigation. Another, so this is one of the reasons why we really started the Raoul Wallenberg uh, Research Initiative, uh, because we wanted to fill the gaps that exist in the official record. And we wanted to do it in a systematic way. And we wanted to, uh, to find a way to create as concrete questions as we can possibly uh, do, to, to make the questions as precise and as concrete and therefore as manageable um, as we could. So we identified uh, various archives and various collections where we know that documentation exists and we have submitted these very precise questions to archivists. And so this is really a way uh, that we have narrowed down the precise information that we know exists and that we need. How do we know this exists? We have uh, through, you know, through research through a great experience of, you know, reviewing records identified, um, you know, documentation that we know the Russians have and that they actually do not dispute having. It's just a question of gaining access to this material. Yes, I mean, obviously, uh, when you get a document where stuff is blacked out, we know they've got something there and they're not disclosing it to us. Uh, and, and also, as, as Susanna has indicated, there's a long history of saying, we've given you everything, and then later they come up with something else. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it rings hollow. And uh, the, the, the research initiative has produced uh, 11 pages of listed documents that uh, are available, could be disclosed, haven't been disclosed. So it, it's not just a matter of uh, we're saying, tell us more. Uh, we've got very specific uh, documents that are listed and where they're found, and uh, and, uh, and so we know exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, but I want to add to this, I think one of the fundamental problems that we're facing is that the Russian side at this point says 
that they have no additional information that would really shed light on the crucial question, which is really what happened to Raoul Wallenberg and why was he arrested and why was he not released? Those are the, really the central questions that have remained unanswered. And the biggest problem is, should we believe this or should we not? And as David just says, one of the reasons why we are hesitant to accept this is because uh, clearly every time they've said, well, we don't have any documents, new documentation, new information pops up. Um, at the same time, we have ourselves identified a whole set of questions and uh, requests and documentation that we feel is necessary to review in, before any, you know, final conclusions about Wallenberg's fate can be drawn. Um, on the Swedish side, the problem is that the Swedish authorities have essentially accepted the Russian claim. And this has led really to a stalemate because if you accept that the Russian side cannot provide full clarity about Wallenberg's fate, then you cannot proceed. Again, we felt very strongly that we, that the questions that we have and that the indications that we have is that there's, you know, very important material that we must see and that we should review and that is available and that must be available and that also our efforts to um, address these questions would lead to new and creative ways to find new avenues of research and avenues to solve this case. Or at the very least, uh, it is impossible to say exactly if the Russian side knows the full truth, but it is quite clear that they know far more than they have so far told us. And that is something that we are building on. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, I mean, the, the major question, of course, is uh, what happened to Raoul Wallenberg, but there, there's two subsidiary questions, which is, why are the Russians behaving this way uh, and, and not being fully cooperative? And why are the Swedes behaving this way, being so passive about this and, and not pushing the pot? And uh, we, we need answers to all three of those questions. Well, this is, again, I mean, one of the reasons why we created this uh, initiative, because we wanted to... Uh, really address the case in a broader context. The, for whatever reasons, the, uh, the research parameters that we used during the working group and during the 90s were rather narrow. Uh, they were sometimes limited really just to the question of Wallenberg's, you know, what happened to Raoul Wallenberg uh, in the Soviet Union. So we felt that if we tried to address the other still unsolved questions, um, that if we slightly broadened the, um, you know, broadened the inquiry, it could lead us to some very important additional uh, material and additional avenues of inquiry. And so this is something where on the Swedish side, one of the biggest unsolved questions today is why, the, why the, was the Swedish passivity in the question of Wallenberg's fate so extreme? Why did they not you know, where did they act with more determination and vigor to solve Wallenberg's disappearance? And the, on that front too, in uh, recent weeks and months, we have made quite a bit of progress. And uh, this, these new findings have really led to very important new questions and also have challenged some very long held assumptions. And the new questions that have arisen on the Swedish side of the equation is really um, whether or not Sweden in 1946 made possibly a conscious, intentional decision to abandon Raoul Wallenberg to his fate. And that is a very serious question. And the next question that follows up on that is, of course, the question of motive and intent. You know, why would Sweden behave this way? What would prompt this decision to uh, abandon him? And so the underlying question to that is why was Wallenberg so expendable to Soviet, uh, to Swedish authorities? So, and it, again, the other thing is that these two inquiries really in many ways intersect uh, because we have now also identified some parallel gaps in the official record. And I can get into that perhaps a little bit later. 
Yes, with the Swedes, uh, what we saw was that they were saying Wallenberg was dead, even when the so uh, Soviets weren't. Uh, and uh, they refused to offer a prisoner exchange, whereas because uh, they had some uh, Soviet prisoners, uh, when many other countries were offering prisoner exchange, and they even rejected feelers for prisoner exchange. Uh, so the behavior requires some explanation. Yes, I think you're referring in particular why Sweden, why Swedish officials so readily accepted the idea that Wallenberg was dead uh, mm -hmm. when there were really many indications that he could well be alive. So this goes back to the same issue that I just mentioned is why was Wallenberg so expendable? Why, why were they so hesitant to uh, vigorously pursue uh, the, you know, clarifying his disappearance? And, and this is uh, not just a, a 45 problem, it's a contemporary problem. Uh, the uh, Sweden is now the chair, uh, the rotating chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and hasn't placed this amongst their priorities. Canada has raised it, uh, Wallenberg's an honorary citizen of Canada, but Sweden hasn't. Well, since the end of the working group in 2001, this is one of the biggest problems is that this, that for for Sweden and for Russia as well, this case is now a historical matter. It no longer is part of the official agenda. And with that, Sweden says, and so does Russia, that they are supporting researchers and Wallenberg's family in their efforts to, to establish the full circumstances of Wallenberg's disappearance. Uh, but what that means is that Swedish officials themselves do no longer raise particular research requests or you know, questions to Russian authorities. This is very problematic because it leaves the burden uh, on the shoulders of researchers and the family. And it makes, of course, a big difference if a researcher poses a question than if the Swedish government poses a question. And so this is really something where we feel very strongly that Sweden has a responsibility and should show some determination to um, to clarify many of these questions that we have identified and these very crucial requests for documentation by themselves, you know, raising them with, with Russian authorities. And they have begun to do this. Uh, for example, the Swedish Foreign Minister Anlinde recently again spoke directly to her counterpart, uh, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Uh, but again, it's always you know, as part of pushing the request of the researchers or the family, it is never presented as a Swedish government request. It's never an official Swedish government request. And I think it will take that kind of, um, it, it will take that kind of intervention and initiative to push the case further. Well, well, I would uh, go beyond that. I, I, I agree, of course, it's important that Swedes do that. But I think that uh, in Canada, where he's an honorary citizen, the United States, where he's an honorary citizen, Israel, I think he's also an honorary citizen. Uh, these countries and, and Hungary, where he's very, uh, very much involved, the, these countries have, uh, I think, is legitimate standing to also to push, to push these qu specific questions forward. No, I, I think it's uh, absolutely crucial that that there's a signal sent that the truth about this man's fate matters. And if that is conveyed to Russian authorities in a very clear way and in a very consistent way, not only from one source, but from many sources, mm -hmm. then it could really make a difference. And I want to also point out that you know, on the Russian side, the issue of access to information and uh, access to, to archives, is, it, it's not just a Russian problem. It's also a problem in other countries, in Western countries, in the United States, in Germany, Sweden, Great Britain. You know, every country has their secrecy laws, they have their rules and regulations. Um, but the problem is that Many of these records, for example, public records that should be made available to researchers uh, are kept in private archives, which means that they become inacce inaccessible because the regular rules of access uh, do not apply. 
So Russia is not alone, and Russia has you know its own set of laws, but it should also be made clear that in the case of a political prisoner who has been rehabilitated, they are, you know, these this should this information should be provided. And this is where we get to the question of the right to the truth. We have international laws and convention. Wallenberg was uh, a diplomat. He was illegally detained. He, his immunity was violated. And we have the Convention of Enforced Disappearance, which, which grants victims of oppression in their families the right to the truth, right to information. So, you know, this also becomes a test case of international law. Uh, because what good are these laws and conventions if they cannot be enforced? So I think we need, you know, a real discourse and discussion about how to move the case forward. But as David said, it's absolutely crucial that the countries where Wallenberg is an honorary citizen, that they, you know, that they begin to really make a stand on his behalf. Yeah, if I could just say a bit about the uh, contemporary legal scene. The the Convention on Enforced Disappearances, uh, Canada hasn't signed, uh, Sweden has signed but not ratified, Russia hasn't signed. Uh, but there's also a Declaration on Disappearances, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, generally adopted uh, as customary international law, and which says that disappearance is a continuing offense uh, uh, until uh, the fate of the disappeared person is explained. So it isn't just a historical offense. I mean, Wallenberg didn't just disappear in 45, he, he's disappeared today. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you, you've heard Susanna refer to the family. I mean, there's a couple of his uh, nieces, uh, Louise Von Dardel and Marie Von Dardel, who are very uh, actively concerned and continuing concerned. And, and, and they remain individual family victims of his disappearances uh, to this day. Russia is a party to the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Torture, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, and the uh, the uh, disappearance of Raoul uh, Wallenberg is, is a violation of all of those. Uh, and, and so they are bound by the legal obligations in, in those uh, instruments. And, uh, and Sweden... Uh, uh, and Canada are parties to the covenant, uh, uh, the, uh, the civil and political covenant, and the uh, the torture convention uh, as well. Uh, and the Europe and and Sweden would be a, a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. I would like to also add another thing about another point about this question of whether or not the case can be solved, because in the end, that is, I think, the crucial matter. If you know, if there is information that can actually uh, tell us what exactly happened. Um, we know that uh, there was a, a great deal of institutional knowledge well into the 1990s and 2000s, meaning that some of the main um, protagonists in the Wallenberg case, in the Soviet leadership, interrogators, uh, other you know, high-level Soviet officials, were alive and uh, you know, who had a direct role in events. And so, therefore, it seems highly unlikely that this knowledge was not tapped at some point. And that this information was not shared, or if, even if there are gaps in the, in the knowledge with certain individuals in the Soviet leadership. So this information is available. And another point I'd like to make is that historic truth matters. That's a very important point to stress, because the issues that are at the heart of the Wallenberg case are as relevant as they were 77 years ago when he disappeared. This includes, for example, uh, the rights of the individual versus the state. Um, these, these things are as crucial and as current in the you know, momentary discourse as they were 77 years ago. So even though this, so the search for historic truth is not just some kind of, um, you know, some kind of laborious exercise, but it is really together with re remembrance, the key step in enabling us to learn from history. And so that is something that we should very much keep in mind. So it's not only that we're doing it for this one person, but we're doing 
this also for us, for all of us. Yes, uh, I, I would add uh, also that uh, it's important it, it, where there is a contest, let's say, about security or privacy, because th those are some of the excuses we get for non-disclosure, that those excuses be subject to judicial review. They, they can't just be imposed arbitrarily whenever there's a, a wish for non-disclosure. Uh, and also, I would say, because I'm involved in uh, human rights in a number of countries in a number of different ways. Uh, I see this kind of statement very often. You don't need to see this. You don't need to investigate. We know everything. We've seen everything. Uh, we'll tell you there's nothing there. I mean, that's a very common statement I see from governments. Uh, and, and that's not the way the search for truth should work. Uh, I mean, the uh, I mean, even if you take it good faith, what they say, different people can see different things, different approaches for lead to different analyses. Uh, it, it, if there's nothing there, it should be we should be able to see that there's nothing there. Uh, we shouldn't just be told there's nothing there. Yeah. And we have really tried to make it as easy as possible because we have really we have understood that, that you know it's it's not feasible to just say to, you know, Russian side now, please, you know, just let us see all the documents, all the co collections, that, that is just simply not possible. Anybody who does research understands what a vast, um, you know, number of documents and collections we would potentially have to review. But, um, you know, so we have definitely, we, we have taken this approach of creating as concrete and precise an approach and so that you know other governments and other entities can also you know make these requests and push these issues so that we can finally you know we can say we can pinpoint particular sets of documents that we need to see and that really should be you know that is manageable and that the russian side um, is asked questions that they can and should answer and to produce documents that they can and must show. Yeah, and we're just, uh, you know, running to the to the end of our panel discussion right now. And obviously, Raoul Wallenberg, a man who was much celebrated, not just in Canada, all the way around the world, uh, yet very, very little, as, as we've come to understand here today, is understood of his ultimate fate. And so I guess two closing thoughts or questions, maybe from both of you as we as we wrap this up. Can we truly honor the life of a man like Raoul Wallenberg without pressuring our, our governments, I'll say in plural, because there are many, many governments that should be working on this together to do everything in their power uh, to, to gain access to these documents and specific questions as, as Susanna was talking about earlier and share these with the world, share this with independent researchers so that you know the truth can come out and and just the last thing are, are there any last points that either one of you would like to make uh, on this topic that that we haven't uh, that you haven't shared so far yeah well i would say that uh the uh Walbert case presents a, a great anomaly in the sense that he's very much honored but very little help uh and uh he who helped so m many people by so much has received so little help himself and his family. Uh, and, and we should do something commensurate with what he has done for others to, to try to help him and his family to rescue his fate. And uh, when his fate is unsolved, it's not just yesterday's problem, uh, it, it's today's problem. Uh, the uh, And if we do nothing, we become part of the victimization uh, of him and his family. Uh, and uh, this is something th that I think falls to us because of so much he has done for us uh, as humanity. Yeah, and I, you know, when I look at the film and when I think about Wallenberg, what strikes me always is that I think the reason why his story resonates so much with all of us is that he really represents the best in all of us. That means the best in humanity. Uh, his legacy is one of um, extreme kindness, empathy, activism, and astounding courage, both mor moral and physical. And I think nothing tells about a person more than his or her reflexive responses to crisis or to 
certain emergencies. And Wallenberg's reflexive response was to jump into the fray and to help his fellow human beings. In the, he was a maximizer of efforts. And that's what I really would like to see, that we find ways to maximize our efforts on his behalf. And I think if we join um, together, then we are stronger. And then we can really, I think, um, make, set, set a sign and set a signal that is worthy of his legacy. Well, thank you. So, uh, B'nai B'rith Canada and its advocacy arm, the League for Human Rights, uh, would like to, to thank you both, Van Berger, David Matus, Erwin Kotler, for their participation today in our special and revealing panel discussion about Raoul Wallenberg. We'd also like to thank Kelly Fry of River TV, who produced the movie The Angel of Budapest, and permitted us to share the film with you during our presentation today. Just a reminder that the video of this entire presentation will remain available to watch uh, on our website, www.benebrith.ca, and our YouTube channel, Benebrith Canada. It is also extremely important that you sign the petition that we have prepared. Again, you can see this link below right now. And, um, and please do scroll down, sign the petition, um, and uh, you will uh, be emailed by our communications department shortly once you do sign that petition. If you do not receive our emails in the organizations, please sign up at our website, benebrith.ca, uh, to be sure to keep informed regularly by our press releases and communiques to the public. For Benebrith Canada, I'm Michael Mostyn signing off and wishing all of you the best in 2022 and justice in this year for Raul Wallenberg. Thank you. <laughs>